Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Narissa Haynes, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today entitled Telemedicine in the COVID-19 Era, Current Concepts and Research for Wearables for Atrial Fibrillation Monitoring. Our program today is in part supported by Johnson & Johnson in collaboration with Apple. For today's program, we will discuss telemedicine in the COVID-19 era, the evolving roles of wearables for atrial fibrillation monitoring and heartline study. We have an informative and impactful program planned for you today. We look forward to a lively discussion at the end of the program. So please remember to submit any questions that you may have during the presentations in the chat. So I would first like to provide a little bit of an introduction. So to start, I would like to outline some of the disparities that we face in atrial fibrillation diagnosis and management. As many of you know, atrial fibrillation is a major risk factor for stroke and increases the risk of stroke significantly. However, despite the clear benefit in diagnosing and treating atrial fibrillation, there are striking racial disparities in diagnosis and treatment. One study, the REGARD study, found that the probability of black participants being aware of their atrial fibrillation was one third that of white participants. Additionally, of those who were aware that they had atrial fibrillation, the probability of black participants being treated with atrial fibrillation was only one fourth fourth that of white participants. Thus, the need to improve the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation and treatment among people of color, and especially among Black Americans, is clear. Wearables provide an opportunity for early and large-scale screening like never before. Studies, such as the Heartline study, are investigating the utility of wearable devices, applications, at and technology in detecting atrial fibrillation and treating atrial fibrillation. Thus, there is a real opportunity here to address some of the disparities that I just outlined. One issue, however, is that minority en enrollment in clinical trials is low. Studies have shown that on average, African Americans make up only 5% of clinical trial participants. Hispanics make up only 1% on average. Given these disparities in enrollment, can digital health studies such as the Heartline study increase African-American enrollment and provide an opportunity to address the disparities in atrial fibrillation di diagnosis and treatment? With those questions in mind, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Keith Ferdinand who is a cardiovascular and hypertension specialist and a full professor at Tulane School of Medicine. Dr. Ferdinand is a member of the Association of University Cardiologists, past chair of the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, and prior chief science officer and chair of the ABC and board member of the American Society for Preventive Cardiology. He has conducted numerous trials on hypertension, lipids, cardiometabolic risk and cardiovascular disease, especially pertaining to racial and ethnic minorities. He has well over 200 peer reviewed publication and has given numerous lectures both nationally and internationally. Dr. Ferdinand, I now turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction and thank to my colleagues for this opportunity. I'm gonna set the table with an overview of how medicine and COVID-19 has changed and why the Heartline study using a means of monitoring patients outside of the usual clinical setting may actually be the future and how it impacts our day-to-day -day medical care. Here are my disclosures, nothing related directly to this presentation. We're now living in very turbulent times. We have social injustice, questions of racial equality. Many people are now aware of the health disparities which have been present for decades, and COVID-19 has unmasked those inequities. We also know that COVID-19 doesn't affect all members of our society equally. 
the elderly especially are hit hard from COVID-19. Racial and ethnic minorities, including Native Americans or American Indians, Hispanic, Latinx populations, African Americans, and persons who are homeless. This is not just a numbers game. It actually affects longevity itself. Many of you may have seen this particular headline from USA Today and other public publications that Black patients now are projected to live three times shorter life expectancy than that of whites. These data are based on a study that actually looked at the reductions projected in US life expectancy due to loss of life from COVID-19 published in February of this year. What it shows is that that white black death gap, which has been persistent since the 1980s has now gotten worse. It narrowed somewhat around 2015, but with the 2.7 years decrease in life expectancy in the black population, we now will see an increase in the white black death gap. The impact of COVID-19 in our clinical care has been very important to recognize. It includes transitioning to outpatient visits to televisits, group activities canceled, many patients have lost their jobs, and many patients now have missed appointments. The effect of COVID-19 also has had a great psychological effect. Beyond the immediate mortality of COVID-19, there's been tremendous psychic trauma and mental burnout and stress. There's been interruption of the resources that have been given for non-COVID conditions. And we will expect that it's impacted and interrupted chronic care. Now, I was trained that the art and science of medicine demands direct inpatient care, sitting down eye level, touching the patient, speaking in a literacy appropriate, culturally appropriate manner. Nevertheless, you're gonna hear from the Heartline study and others. We now know that clinical research and clinical care itself can be done beyond the face-to-face -face encounter. In fact, both for the provider and the patient, there are benefits in telemedicine. For the provider, reducing non-shows, increasing our flexibility, expanding clinic hours. For the patient, it now is increasingly convenient to communicate with providers. We now can educate the patient and their family, and it actually decreases lost time by visiting the outpatient setting. Now, one of my fields of expertise is in hypertension. And we've already embraced that self-measured blood pressure monitoring is necessary to get a better blood pressure load is throughout the day. And in fact, there's one site, validatebp.org, where you can send your patients to get validated devices in order to communicate often by Bluetooth with the clinic for their blood pressure results. Now, specifically as it relates to telehealth and arrhythmic monitoring, this report came from multiple societies, both in Europe and here in the United States, published just this year in 2021. What this society report suggested is that monitoring strategies during the pandemic are here to stay. And I think the Heartline study has demonstrated that for clinical trials, perhaps we can do them in novel manners. Virtual clinics are gonna go way beyond the simple telephone contact, integrating photos, video, mobile heart rhythms, and other devices. And you hear more of this from Dr. Kwaku. For instance, if we were concerned about patients having interruption in their care related to a prolonged QTC interval, we now can get ECG data that can be remotely processed and sent to the provider to make decisions on whether or not to initiate or continue treatment. Nevertheless, there are real barriers to the implementation of telemedicine going forward, inadequate reimbursing, problems related to licensure, and I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. Some physicians have a resistance to change and patients may have a lack of access or poor internet connections and restricted financial resources. 
For our older population, there may be limited technical skills in order to embrace some of the new technology. And for some people, telehealth and remote ECG monitoring may be difficult because it may be unaffordable or unavailable. Now, in terms of the barriers related to licensure, here's another recent report published again this year in the New England Journal of Medicine that looks at potential paths for reform such that clinicians can utilize telemedicine more effectively across state lines. What was suggested were several pathways. One, build on the present state-based license and make it easier to get out of state licensure. Encourage reciprocity. Have the patients and the physicians have their licensure, have a relationship based on the physician's location instead of the patient's location. And perhaps the most sweeping suggestion is that we implement a federal licensure such that patients can now treat patients anywhere in the 50 United States and territories. Here's a map of current interstate medical licensures in which there is a relationship. I'm presently in Louisiana. I have patients who are in Mississippi, no more than a suburban ride away, 45 minutes, but I no longer can use the telemedicine or telehealth approach because of the barriers across state lines. Nevertheless, you're gonna hear more about Heartline and you're gonna hear more about using these tools presently for clinical research and perhaps in the future for clinical care. And perhaps one of the silver linings of this terrible pandemic has been the understanding among physicians, academics, and policymakers that the COVID-19 pandemic may serve as an opportunity to use technologies as an indispensable tool for the future practice of cardiology. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Ferdinand, for that fantastic presentation. I would now like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Kevin Kwaku. Dr. Kwaku is co-chair of ABC's Fellows Committee and is currently Director of Cardiac Electrophysiology at Dartmouth Medical Center and Assistant Professor of Medicine at Dartmouth. He also previously served as Chief of Cardiology for Kaiser Permanente in Honolulu, Hawaii. In 2015, he was elected to the Board of Governors of the American College of Cardiology. Dr. Kwaku has also authored numerous peer-reviewed papers and three book chapters in translational clinical electrophysiology. He also currently serves on the editorial board of the Journal of American College of Cardiology, Clinical Cardiac Electro, uh, Electrophysiology. I would now like to introduce Dr. Kwaku. Good day, everyone. It's my um, great privilege uh, and honor to speak today uh, regarding the evolution of wearable uh, monitoring technologies for the detection of atrial fibrillation. I'd like to uh, thank the ABC as well as the sponsors um, for the opportunity. Um, here are my disclosures. So uh, when we speak of wearable or mobile monitoring technologies, they can come in many different forms. Um, and it seems like every day there's a new technology out there. We're going to review the most important ones in daily clinical practice and the ones that seem to be offer the greatest promise. In particular, on the left-hand side of the slide, you see all the physiologic parameters that can be recorded with patches and different uh, devices. And on the right, uh, a non-exhaustive list of the devices. We're going to focus on heart rate uh, and arrhythmia and ECG technologies, specifically as recorded by smartphones and uh, smart watches. Next slide. So to do that, it's very important that we understand and, and are able to distinguish between photoplethysmography and electrocardiography. Now, the latter of these two terms should be familiar to you, it's just an ECG, and we know that's recording changes in electrical potential recorded from surface uh, electrodes. Next slide. In the case of PPG, however, what we're recording is light, fluctuations in light. Uh, it requires a light source, it requires a photo detector, and what we do is we record changes that occur um, associated with volumetric changes in the precapillary uh, arterioles with each heartbeat. And uh, the changes in light may either be um, in terms of reflection, if the light source and detection are on the same side, or transmission on the other side. And this is very uh, common technology. It exists on commercial apparatus like treadmills and bicycles. And it's also the basic uh, concept that's used for pulse oximetry found in the hospital, although with a small twist. 
So with uh, the development of cell phones and the ubiquitous um, location of cell phones in everyone's pocket, everyone now has the opportunity to do PPG heart rate monitoring. The cell phone integrates a light source and you know, the flashlight, uh, a photo detector, the lens of the camera. Uh, there's computing uh, capability on the smartphone uh, and a screen to, to report the results. Not only are you able to record your pulse rate, but also it didn't take very long for developers of apps using uh, the features on the smartphone to figure out whether or not the pulse is regular or irregular and can give you some feedback with respect to that. I'd like to point out though, that an irregular pulse is not necessarily the same as atrial fibrillation. Um, and for that, only very specific algorithms have been FDA approved to detect uh, AF with reasonable accuracy. For example, in this slide, if you look at the bottom um, panel of the slide, it would be hard for me to look at that uh, tachygram, if you will, of the PPG signal on the left-hand side and determine whether or not it represented atrial fibrillation or normal rhythm with frequent ectopy. So on the left, you see how a PPG algorithm can be used uh, with respect to using a smartphone. And it didn't take long for our industry uh, friends to say, well, um, this requires an active uh, movement on the part of the patient, let's put the detector and a light source on the back of a wristwatch, a smartwatch or other wristband uh, and be able to do constant monitoring. And uh, certainly now we're all familiar with these technologies that are widely spread. So there are some features and caveats with PPG recording. It is uh, energy efficient, it doesn't require a lot of energy to provide that light. Um, what is nice specifically with the smart watches um, it doesn't necessarily require subject interaction that allows passive monitoring. Um, but in terms of disadvantages and caveats, it is prone to signal artifacts, uh, movement artifacts, especially with physical activity. And a very important uh, in terms of an equity access issue, darker skin may be associated with decreased accuracy in these devices as light uh, may uh, either not reflect as well or be transmitted through darker skin. So this brings us to the recording of an actual electrocardiogram. And the AliveCore Cardio mobile device was the first uh, to be developed uh, where you were able to actually record an ECG and transmit it to a smartphone. Now, what's interesting with this technology is very ingenious. It doesn't require any Bluetooth technology or other such connectivity, but rather the way that the information is transmitted is that on the device that is highly portable, uh, the ECG is transduced into a sound signal and it's very high pitched, you can't even hear it, but it is picked up by the device's microphone, which then transduces it back to an ECG. Um, and so therefore there need to be no electronic or um, you know, cable connection between the device and your smartphone. If you uh, place the electrodes in different uh, locations, you're able to record a sequential multi-lead ECG as shown on the right. Next slide. And so only a few years after the development of that device, um, the AliveCore Corporation came out with a nice accessory uh, to the Apple Watch, a band which incorporated two electrodes, one on the back of the watch and the other on the side that could be touched and thereby um, creating your lead one between the left arm and right arm um, and have that ECG transmitted to your smart watch rather than a smartphone. New line, uh, next slide please. And um, most recently, uh, Apple has developed in its series four and uh, beyond uh, integrated all of this in its Apple Watch. And so in this watch, the two electrodes reside in the case of the watch on the back, as well as on the crown on the side. And it's, uh, you are able to record with appropriate filtering, quite high fidelity electrocardiograms. And in fact, um, they're able to distinguish and diagnose atrial fibrillation with uh, reasonable specificity and sensitivity. Next slide. 
So, you know, how well do we, these technologies work for us? Um, are they just a toy or can they be leveraged into a real tool for us in the care of patients? I'll just quickly show you some highlights of three quick trials. This was the REHEARSE AF study, which randomized 1,000 patients over 65 years old to random care versus a twice weekly recording uh, using a, at a live core cardio device. Um, and uh, those recordings were then uh, sent remotely, uh, interpreted. They were overread by electrophysiologists. And uh, sure enough, uh, within uh, actually really uh, before the first year, you were able to see a statistically significant uh, improvement in the capture or detection of early atrial fibrillation, which then was able to trigger appropriate uh, therapy to, such as anticoagulation. Another landmark paper was the Apple Heart Study, only a few years later, 2019, published in the New England Journal. Um, this uh, trial is notable for its absolute scope. Um, it used a pragmatic, sightless design where patients uh, provided informed consent via their app, uh, and they were able to enroll over 400,000 participants over eight months. Um, these participants were age 22 and over. And as you can see in the uh, top right slide, um, unsurprisingly, most of the notifications of irregular pulse, and this was a PPG-based uh, study, this was not using the ECG uh, feature of, of the later Apple watches uh, initially. And you can see that most of the notifications occurred in the 65 and greater uh, set as expected. And that study um, you know, found, nevertheless, once you, uh, you, you take a look at all the uh, notifications, uh, a positive predictive value uh, in the 80s. Next slide. Uh, finally, um, there was the WASH AF trial out of Europe. Uh, this uh, was a sort of uh, case control study uh, where they took patients who were hospitalized, many of whom had atrial fibrillation on and off, um, and really it was a test of a specific algorithm regarding uh, a Samsung watch uh, where patients either wore the watch um, and also used a, a so-called IECG um, for diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. What they found is actually there was quite a few uh, recordings that had to be discarded uh, due to poor quality with the PPG. But nonetheless, of those that were recorded and, and deemed that, uh, you know, adequate for interpretation, as you can see in the slide, the sensitivity and specificities of the recordings were quite high. So, can current wearable monitoring technologies and associated apps reliably monitor the heart rate? Absolutely. Um, can they reliably be used to screen for atrial fibrillation? And it seems that the answer uh, increasingly is a resounding yes. Can they reliably diagnose or confirm atrial fibrillation in our patients? And I don't think that um, it is ready for prime time for that. I think it's good um, for screening in well-selected populations. Um, but um, on occasion, on a one on one basis, absolutely can. Be. I've made many a diagnosis of AFib uh, in recordings that were sent to me by their, my patients. The really important question is, can they be used effectively to manage atrial fibrillation and to optimize outcomes? And we don't have a study really to showing that uh, yet. Um, the answer is probably, but how best to accomplish that remains to be determined. So I like to think that the future is now. Um, studies like the Heartline study are truly designed to answer the question I just posed. Can we leverage wearable monitoring technologies with apps to close the loop with our patients to improve outcomes, make recordings of pathophysiologic events, process them, interpret them, confirm them, and return that information and feed that back to our patients? Um, thereby driving patient uh, engagement in their own care and uh, improved outcomes. I look forward to Dr. Wang's presentation upcoming that will describe the details of the Heartline study. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kwaku, uh, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. John Wang. Dr. Wang is a seasoned cardiologist and lead of integrated evidence in cardiovascular disease and metabolism at Janssen Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Wang has tremendous expertise in strategy development and implementation, as well as technology solutions and digital care. 
I would now like to turn the floor over to Dr. Wang to tell us more about the Heartline study. Thank you, Dr. Haynes. And uh, thank you to both Dr. Ferdinand and to Dr. Kwaka for their great presentations. And of course, to ABC for hosting this event. So thank you all. And thank you to the audience for taking the time to join us. What I would like to cover is um, the Heartline study, which has been mentioned several times uh, so far. And as you can see on this slide, it's wearable and app-based technologies in individuals 65 and over. So I'll get into some detail uh, right now about this. So just as background, you know, I think that everyone understands that AFib, as already been said, is a big stroke risk factor. The strokes, as you know, also tend to be devastating when they do occur. Um, there are a lot of people, and, and with the demographic shift in the US expected over the number of years, this is only expected to increase. And you can see there at the bottom, the frequency with which someone develops a stroke here in the US. It's a pretty devastating condition. And uh, a lot of it is secondary to AFib that we think can be addressed with technology. Next page. So I think this was mentioned by Dr. Ferdinand, 30%, uh, or no, Dr. Haynes, 30% often go undiagnosed um, until actually something happens, a clinical event actually happens. And you can see there are a little factoid to the right there that blacks are one third as um, uh, likely as white people to detect that they actually have uh, the condition. And even in the same individual, I'm sure all of you know as clinicians that over time these things can change. So I've had patients who, you know, at whatever age they could detect AFib and then as they age, they begin to not be able to sense it. So even in the same individual, what is true at one time is not always true later on. So I think that's a, a consideration that we all have seen. Next page. So what is Heartline? So Heartline is this direct to participant. So there are no sites in the standard clinical trial model. Uh, that is the word decentralized there that the FDA prefers to the word virtual. Um, they felt that virtual means that it may actually not be real. Um, but in fact, of course, it's a very real study, but they prefer the term decentralized. This is randomized. I'll get into the design in a moment. And it's pragmatic in the sense that it's not dictating every step of treatment once a patient is either identified or as potentially having AFib or telling them what to do. It's more directing them to touch the healthcare system to then let the healthcare system assume the work that it, it should do. So in that sense, it's very pragmatic. You can see there it's gonna run for two years through engagement with the app and some watch base activities. And I'll get into that in a moment. Next page. So who can participate? This is really open to anyone who has or has not AFib in, the back, in, in their history, um, but you do have to be 65 or older. As Dr. Kwaku mentioned in the Apple Heart Study, most of the detection of AFib occurred in this patient cohort. Um, you can be a healthy individual. Uh, you don't have to be that healthy. We certainly don't want terminally ill patients, of course, um, but really, almost irrespective of any level of significant dementia or of terminal illness, um, people over the age of 65 qualify to enter. And even those who have atrial fibrillation, although a lot of the discussion so far has been about screening, what we're also trying to test uh, in Hardline is this idea of adherence. And I'll get to that in a moment. So people who have AFib, who've been on a DOAC for at least 30 days um, also qualify. US resident, because we're collaborating with Apple, of course they prefer an iPhone 6 and, and we understand the restrictions that this may place on, on the breadth of the potential population that could participate, but it was a requirement to work with Apple and we, we couldn't find really an Android uh, collaborator who could commit to one platform. In other words, as you know, LG versus Samsung, versus another uh, Huawei phone maker, Android phone maker, each of those has a slightly different app requirement and coding requirements. So we couldn't, it would, it would require uh, multiple levels of work. And if we wanted to make a change to the app, we, it would triple the work. So in some ways, this actually simplified things for us to go with 
a single um, operating system, the iOS. On the other hand, the downside, of course, is that it does restrict the potential uh, population. But we tried to address this, and I'll get to this in a moment, about how we're able to address um, people who, who um, might not be able to typically get an Apple Watch or want to get an Apple Watch, um, but they do have to have an iPhone. And of course, uh, they need to read and understand English. This Medicare coverage is an important point because one of the ways that we're determining the outcomes, which I'll get to in a moment for the study, is actually a claims-based analysis of events, which was the easiest way to, to assess whether a clinical event had happened for us, especially in a decentralized model. Okay, next page. So just one quick page on, and if you wouldn't mind cycling through the build on this. So from left to right here, the first that study that we did was M-STOPS. It was published in JAMA about two years ago, three years ago at this point. And really what we did was we patched people with um, a Zeo patch and uh, for two weeks. And then we used an observational case control to see if in fact there was increased detection of AFib, of course, which there was. Um, based on the data that Dr. Kwaku showed, it was replicated. But then um, we, with Scripps and Steve Steinhubel in particular, uh, proved that actually there was, a, first of all, a trend toward decreased high intensity utilization, such as ER and hospitalization visits. But then also, um, and this is a pending uh, manuscript, there is some evidence of an improvement in outcomes, hard outcomes, such as stroke and death. Now, this still, has to be accepted into a publication, but that's what uh, they had presented at AHA uh, just last year. So with that, um, we, uh, and, then, and then the Apple Heart Study came out, which was the real world use of Apple technology to detect AFib in people who are all comers, whether they had AFib or not. Um, and you saw there in Dr. Kwaku's presentation, the percent of detection of atrial fibrillation in the 65 and over cohort. Um, and then to the right, you can see there now is the launch of Heartline, again in collaboration with Apple, but now we're trying to determine outcomes. So the M-STOPs had a hint toward improving outcomes when you, when you opportunistically screen for AFib. The question now is whether you actually improve outcomes, right? Because that's the real question, and that's what we hope to answer in Heartline. Okay, next page. So here, here's the clinical sort of like schema. So moving from left to right, and then I'll focus on the top pink box and then the bottom pink box. So as I said on the left, adult 65 and over with an iPhone 6S or later with an iOS of 13 or later, we identify screen, onboard and consent all within the app. So this doesn't require a visit to any physical site. And that's the decentralized, that's part of the decentralized design. And then once they um, go through the step of identification, screening, onboarding, and consenting, depending on whether they have AFib or not, if they don't have AFib, they go into the top pink box. So no history of AFib and they don't own a watch. Now, if you happen to have a patient who owns a watch, they can enter into a group called BYOD, bring your own device. But what we are trying to do is really focus on recruiting people who don't have watches, which thankfully is actually the majority of the 65 and over population into the study because we want the opportunity to randomize them. And here in the upper pink box, they randomize three to one to watch versus no watch, which is really the standard of care, the no watch arm. And then we detect if in fact they develop a FIB through claims and those who do develop a FIB get an adherence module um, those who, uh, that is in the watch arm, those who don't have a watch and who develop a fib just in the usual course of care, like when they present to a physician's office and they happen to be an AFib without knowing it, or let's say they present to the emergency department or urgency center with symptoms, they just get standard of care, which is actually the care that they currently get in the real world. And what we hope to compare there, an objective one there you can see in the top right there, is first of all, the detection rate of AFib in the real world, does the watch, which relies on two technologies with doc, which Dr. Kwaku mentioned, which is the PPG, the green laser light on the back of the device, and the ECG, which is the ability to take a lead one tracing 
off the Apple Watch Series 4 later, which for those people who are randomized to watch, there are two opportunities for them to gain access to it. One is they can loan it for free. They would have to return it at the end of the study, or they can get it at a special price related to the study. It's a, it's a lower price than retail, um, and of course, to encourage people and to reduce barriers to participation. So um, the core engagement is really through an app. Um, you see there at the top, um, the arrows, the bi-directional arrows. That core engagement is driven through the app, the Heartline app that is paired with the watch. Or if you're randomized to the arm without the watch, it stands on its own. So here, there's a lot of content that's delivered to educate people, not just about AFib, but about heart health in general. Um, and that's for two years, as I had mentioned before, that's the active part of engagement. And then there's a passive registry type follow up for a year after that two year period. But um, at the end of two years, we hope to test for two hypotheses in this particular group. One is the percent of people who are detected to have AFib versus those um, without a watch. So watch without a watch, percent of AFib detection, and then hard outcomes. And it'll be stroke and death plus some other composite endpoints. We're thinking CV hospitalization, hospitalization for heart failure, uh, non-CNS systemic embolism and the like at two years in the watch versus the no watch arm. So that's the bulk of patients that we want to recruit into the study. Now the bottom pink box is for those people who are already diagnosed with AFib, who are on a DOAC, any DOAC, it doesn't have to be any one company's, just any DOAC for at least 30 days. And again, we prefer if people will not be a watch owner and they will get randomized again, three to one watch to no watch, watch with an adherence module or no watch without an adherence module, which is if you think about it, currently what people get when they get started on DOAC. And objective two, the objective there is to look at percent days covered, PDC, which is standard measure for adherence uh, for any medication. As you may know, uh, chronic cardiovascular medications, the adherence is pretty dismal. Usually at six to 12 months, it's anywhere between 50 to 65%, which is for a chronic condition like AFib. So uh, we think that even a slight improvement would be a major public health uh, win. As a matter of fact, when we went to the FDA to talk to them about this study, uh, Bob Temple, whom you a lot of may know, said it's the number one public health problem across all populations. So, uh, and it's always been a difficult thing to crack, but we're, we're, we think that it's worth it to continue to try because it makes such a, a big difference to outcomes. Okay, um, next page. So we often get asked, what's the user experience? So just moving from left to right, if you can take a look here, you can see there that there's this ring that gets filled in as you stand. So as you know, there's a stand function, uh, or you may know with the Apple Watch that it detects a change, slight change in altitude. And if it detects that you're standing, it'll close a ring. Um, that is tracked over time. And there's an algorithm built in that will actually increase uh, and increase expectations for you to stand more and more up to a point. Um, and that is to encourage activity um, of participants in the study. The second screen there from your left is that there's a lot of educational content and uh, the content is uh, different. It is um, different meaning that it's not repeated. Uh, there's a lot of it you can imagine covering two years and it can get into some amount of detail about causes of AFib, uh, procedures that are used to manage AFib, medications, of course, that are used to manage AFib, et cetera. Uh, the middle screen there, the points, there's a point system built into the engagement program within the Heartline app. So if you complete surveys, if you complete some activities, you gain points, all of which are convertible to cash. And this is part of the rewards, which is classic and typical in clinical studies that you reimburse people for their time and their effort. We've done the same thing here, except that they're participating through the app. The second to the last screen on the right there, research, there's another tab called research where we're feeding back some findings from the study. So for example, we lifted a COVID-19 hesitancy survey 
using the Heartline population that had been recruited up until about two months ago. And it's going to be published in PLS1 uh, probably in the next month. And it showed some very interesting findings about this particular population, 65 and over. It was the largest actually sample of 65 and over and their attitudes about vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so we share some findings back with the community that's participating in the study. And then finally, to the right there, you can see there that you've received an irregular rhythm notification. That is the IRN, which is based off the PPG, again, different from the ECG. And it just gives you a sense that the app is linked to the functionality of the Apple Watch to alert patients about the fact that they may have AFib. Now, the two features of the Apple Watch, the ECG and the PPG are not linked. In other words, if you buy an Apple Watch natively, if the IRN or the PPG indicates that you may have AFib, there's nothing indicating that you should take your ECG. But in the Heartline app, we actually link those two Apple Watch features. So if the IRN detects AFib using the green laser light on the back of the device, it will actually instruct the participant to then take an ECG and it walks them through how to take the ECG because as you know, you kind of want to be able to see the tracing, right? As, as a cardiologist or as an internist or as a physician, just to see if in fact, what the IRN detected is in, is in fact AFib. And if you've ever seen the tracing from the ECG of the Apple Watch, it is basically medical grade. I know it's not clear to such, but I've seen it. I've taken my own ECG off the Apple Watch that I have, and it, it has very good resolution. Um, Provided, of course, that the baseline isn't too noisy, um, but if you can get a good tracing, it, your eye will be very well treated to a good tracing, a lead one tracing. So these are some of the key components within the user experience that we think are, are very much value add to the participant. Some metrics just to share, we've had some incredible high engagement numbers. We're about a year into the study, it launched in February. And among tens of thousands of people who are in the study to date, uh, we have metrics that are really off the charts because of the structure here that you see in front of you in terms of the content within the app. Um, it's actually so high that Apple and and J, &J have stood up data science teams to better understand what it is that's driving this degree of engagement. Typically, it's you know for most health apps, it's thirty percent at a month or two. Um, we're a year in and we're in the high 80s. So this is distinctly different. And we think it's because of all these features mixed into one uh, with the device, especially that is uh, keeping people engaged. And if you think about it, this is gonna be super important to clinical trials in general, your retention is always an issue. And you always wonder if you're gonna be able to retain people just through an app into a study. But then if you think about clinical care, if you can keep people engaged in their health, without having to bring them in and travel to see someone and feel bad about doing some, not doing things that the doctor perhaps told them to do the last time they saw them, but instead do it on their own. Um, we think that this may be a new model for self-care on some level uh, that may be able to improve some of the outcomes. And so that's obviously part of this as well, that may be in the mix, it may not just be the watch, it may be the app plus the watch. Okay, next page. So um, if you happen to qualify for the study or if you think your patients might be interested in the study, um, you can get information yourself as providers at heartline.com slash providers. Um, for people uh, who are interested in actually learning more about the study, heartline.com. You can also go to the App Store, the Apple App Store, and just look for Heartline and download it. Um, and of course, if you qualify, mainly Medicare coverage, 65 and over, and with the appropriate equipment, the iPhone, uh, model, uh, you can participate in the study. So um, additional resources also exist in terms of waiting room flyers and whatnot, of course, when things calm down from the pandemic, uh, which to some extent they will, but I think to Dr. Ferdinand's point, you know, uh, telehealth is here to stay. I don't know if you saw recently, there was some evidence that the house is willing to make it more permanent, I think, because the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, and access is just a big a big issue in healthcare, right? Just simple access. And we think that technology can lower that bar, that barrier. So um, 
Uh, but nonetheless, I think in person is still going to be there, of course. And um, there are materials there that can be leveraged for when that actually uh, does come back in, um, in a stable way. Um, the next page, I think, is the last one. Yes, thank you. So once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to present. And I think I'll hand it back to Dr. Haynes at this point. Yes, okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Wang, very much for a very interesting and informative um, presentation. We would now like to open up the discussion and then we invite questions from the audience. If you can please put any questions in the Q&A. Um, but I'll get us started. Um, and so Dr. Wang, just one follow-up question. Do you have any feedback from participants about the usability of the app specifically and their overall experience? Yes, so if you take a look, as you know, every app is rated on the App Store and it's rated at a 4.6 out of five, which is remarkably high for a health app. Um, among the, the people who have provided feedback. And if you read the testimonials there, there are, they, they, it's, it's remarkably positive. If there are any um, complaints that they have, it's more about the fact that they couldn't get in um, because they didn't uh, qualify based on age or they had commercial coverage as opposed to Medicare. And, agree, and again, the reason for Medicare coverage is that we can access all their claims through Blue Button, which is this functionality that Medicare set up really to encourage this sort of research. Um, so, but otherwise in terms of the app engagement, um, remarkably positive, which again, I think explains why the retention and the engagement is so high. Wonderful. And then there is one question from the audience. Um, is utilization of the app covered by Medicare? Is there any cost to participants at all? No, no cost. Well, I mean, if there, so there are two options to part to if you're randomized to a watch. So there's no cost if you get randomized just to the app, right? That's if anything, you'll probably not that this is the point at all, but you can make money basically from participating in the in the clinical study. But if you're randomized to a watch, um, there are two opportunities to gain access to the device. One is to loan it for free. We will loan it for free, and this was. Um, a very sort of lengthy negotiation with Apple. As you know, they, they, they offer premium products only, that's their vision. And so I don't think that they want to have um, things floating around for free, but for the purpose of the study, they permitted this. It's just that there has to be a promise to return the device, either when you leave the study, early termination, or at the end of the study. The other alternative is to purchase the watch and own it um, at a significantly uh, different price from what is retail. Um, and so the price there is $49 per device, which is approximately one tenth or so of the retail price. So we've tried to make it in conjunction with Apple quite accessible. So that's the only cost if randomized to a watch and if you actually wanna own the watch. Other than that, there's no cost. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, the next question, I, I'll open it up to all of our speakers. Um, so one foreseeable barrier uh, to entry is the digital divide, um, specifically in two regards. Um, so for the first level digital divide, which uh, speaks about disparate ownership of smartphones and technological devices, there may be a disparity there. And in fact, we do know there's disparities in smartphone ownership, um, you know, based on socioeconomic status and race, small, but there. Um, and also in terms of digital readiness and how comfortable people feel using um, technology. So, um, so in an older population, how do you attend to address these barriers to achieve equitable access and enrollment? So let me, let me suggest, uh, Dr. Haynes, I actually agree with you that that becomes a concern that I have. In fact, many of the particular older persons, and this is a 65 and older population, have smartphones, may not have full wireless service, and use the smartphone basically as a telephone to call grandkids. So I, I would think we should have a call-in number where there is an ability to at least enter to get information from the study from a, an 800 number. And it sounds simplistic, but we've seen this with the COVID-19 vaccination where 
they say go to this website and click this link and nobody's going because many of the older patients are unable to figure out how to get into the site. Yeah. Um, hey, it's John Wang. So totally agree with that. There are a lot of dots that have to connect for the technology to work in the way that we've sort of have proposed it. Um, you know, one of the things I, I don't know how much, I mean, I don't know if you saw recently the the recent bill from the Senate there, they recognize that broadband, not only in the rural areas is an issue, but also even in urban areas where the affordability is a problem. Um, they are hopeful going to address that. Um, what we think is that, you know, given not, not too much time, uh, there could be a lot of con more connectivity um, and so to the to Dr. Ferdinand's point, it's not there now, but we think that the gap hopefully will close over time. So, you know, there's this one study that we're also running, the Chief Heart Failure Study, and this is an interventional drug study with canical flows. In. And it was actually, it's also a de fully decentralized trial. And we put it into the market because it was actually a learning that we had from, from Heartline. And uh, it's indication seeking with the FDA, and the FDA actually approved the design. Uh, for potential indication. But what, what we found was that we've got, and this is uh, the average age of 64. Uh, this is a heart, all comer heart failure population. Um, so RAF and PATH. And um, the, the average age of 64, and it's 15% black. So in this age segment, 64 and over, the national age uh, uh, matched uh, percent of the population that's black is actually 8%. So we've been able to achieve twice the penetration. And what they're able to do is input their information. This is a, looking at KCCQ as the endpoint, put in their information on the app. And what we've been hearing is that they feel that they're more in control of their data because they're actually putting in and they're not sitting across the table from a provider who's writing something and they don't know what, we've all been in a situation where someone's writing something down in the chart and you don't know what they're writing down. They're actually in control of it and they like that feeling. So um, I think that there are a lot of positives here. I agree we're not there yet, um, but I, what I'm hopeful for, especially with this recent bill for increased funding and just the penetration, people are just gonna age. People who are 55, 58 now, by the time they're in five, six years, they're gonna carry their phones. Into their into their into their sixties and seventies. So very soon, the degree of access to this technology is going to go way way up. So we're trying to play for where the puck is going to be, which I think is going to be around the corner pretty soon. Um, but in terms of addressing it right now, Dr. Haynes, to your original question, we're trying to prep now for what good looks like when the market is ready. Um, and I think that these structural problems uh, we need to address through increased funding. Um, which I think Congress is trying to address and trying to make things as usable as possible to make it as easy as possible for, for people to participate. Great. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Um, we did have two other questions just in terms uh, about the reliability of the uh, smart watch specifically. Is that um, enough to capture? Because I mean, that furniture is big, like the chest is like taller than me. So, no, uh, I don't think maybe Dr. Kwaku, if you could answer in your presentation, you mentioned um, that sometimes the accuracy is affected by darker skin tones. Um, is that a concern um, for this trial specifically in terms of being able to detect atrial fibrillation uh, or screen um, uh, for African Americans? And then there was a also another question from the audience, is accuracy or detection affected by the weather at all or uh, magnetic fields or things like that in the environment? Sure, thanks for the questions. Um, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. Um, the devices are fairly robust. Um, the, uh, the newer series watch uh, by Apple is, is uh, uh, you know, severely water resistant. Um, you know, you've seen the ads of, you know, people wearing them in the rain uh, and so forth. Um, as far as, so, you know, as far as weather, for example, that's really a, a non-issue. Wouldn't go deep sea diving wearing one, 
but otherwise in day-to-day -day use, um, you know, and this is true for all of the technologies, um, you know, the idea is uh, for it to be wearable um, and for patients to be active. So there's gonna be sweat involved ideally. Um, and, um, and, and, and so that's really not a, a, an issue. Um, the whole issue with respect to <clears throat> accuracy of, um, of uh, sort of light penetration into dark skin, uh, that was sp specific to one device. I won't name it here, uh, but, and, and it's clear that there are um, sort of wavelength dependencies in that regard. Uh, I am not aware, nor have I heard that that's a problem with uh, the devices used in, in the heart line. But in some uh, activity monitors, uh, it can be. Uh, and again, it's not a complete lack of data, but there's sort of dropout um, and just sort of lower uh, fidelity recordings. So that can lead to either under detection or over detection. But if somebody's on a bike and you know working really hard and they get a heart rate of 30 or 40, um, you know, they, it's probably not detecting correctly. Um, maybe worth validating by some other means, a pulse or so forth. Um, if it is, then they have another problem. Dr. Haynes, yeah. I had a question for Dr. Quaker, if possible. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yes. Quaker, we know from the cohort studies, like Eric and the VA, that African Americans have less atrial fibrillation. This is in controlled, observed populations. First of all, do you think it's real? And secondly, do you think that this particular approach that we're using in Heartline will be able to give us more data to find out whether or not it really reflects a difference, not necessarily an underrepresentation? Well, thanks for the question. Um, it's, it's a good one. And I think the jury's a little bit out. The preponderance of data that we have currently from some of the sources you mentioned and others seem to um, you know, indicate atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's not so much that African-Americans have it less, but that rather folks of European descent have it more um, than anyone else um, when compared to uh, Latinx and certainly the Asian population. Um, but again, this is, you know, the question is, is this a matter of detection and reporting um, or not? So one interesting thing is, um, uh, you know, if you're wearing a watch-based um, detection mechanism, um, you know, that truly is, we're, you know, with the small exception that I mentioned, colorblind. Um, and so to your point, I'm hoping that uh, trials, um, you know, and studies like Heartline will be able to either confirm or refute this notion um, that, uh, that AFib is less common in uh, underrepresented populations. We have this interesting conundrum uh, and, a, and a bit of a disconnect, for example, looking at cerebrovascular accidents, which we know Blacks have a lot more strokes um, and certainly perhaps have more hypertension, but is that enough to explain what's going on? Uh, might they have a greater proportion of underdetected AFib? And um, the, the, well, it would be good to answer that question definitively. Wonderful, thank you. And um, a question also for uh, Dr. Wang. Um, are there any initiatives or efforts uh, specifically trying to recruit uh, more African-Americans uh, into the study? And uh, are there any intentions to also expanding and doing outreach to the Latinx community by perhaps uh, allowing Spanish speaking or, or uh, participants for whom English is not their first language? Yeah, so on the second point about language, um, we made the decision it was really more for resources uh, than for anything else, the translation, the duplication of absolutely everything. Um, to keep it to English only. So I think you know, it was just the resource constraints there. So unfortunately not, which it makes us very sad because that's certainly a, a big focus of ours, which is to increase access, right? In terms of outreach to um, the Black community, obviously this, we are trying to, in our materials, make sure that there's visual representation. Um, We've tried to work with uh, American Heart at the time 
uh, when they had um, Dr. Benjamin, I think on the stage at the Apple product launch, um, we couldn't get something going together there in time. So unfortunately that, that didn't turn out. We're, we're, we're trying to do this. It, it is, as I said before, in terms of the iPhone, it does skew, um, I think Dr. Haynes, you mentioned this as well, it does skew the population. So we're doing our best, but you know, again, the 65 and over, if we, if we anchor to the 8% in terms of overall uh, population age matched um, percent, then uh, I think that we are hopeful that we can get there. We're, we're not there yet, uh, but study has a ways to go to recruit to its, to its target. So we're hopeful that we'll get there. Wonderful, um, thank you. And maybe just uh, one last question because I know we're running out of time, um, but is there any concern, and I think Dr. Kwaku and Dr. Ferdinand also uh, touched upon this, in choosing um, a patient population for whom wearable devices are most useful? And is there any concern that they could actually increase anxiety uh, for certain patients? Yeah, I think the Apple Heart Study is probably the best real world study about that. So as Dr. Kwaku mentioned, 400 some thousand patients, um, there were 25,000 who were 65 and over. They did do, and I think in the New England Journal paper, you can see a table that talks about whether there was any anxiety that was driven. And uh, that was part of the post uh, participation survey and there wasn't any difference. So that's one data point. Um, second data point is I think that there's a paper in Europace I can't remember where it is, but they looked at utilization of resources, either ER or hospital, in those with wearables versus those who don't have wearables, and there wasn't a discernible difference. So if you think anxiety drives a behavior that increases utilization, it doesn't seem to be the case so far. So I think that to Dr. Kraku's point about, you know, the devices seem to appropriately activate um, awareness, um, and they don't seem to drive unnecessary anxiety or behavior like resource utilization. So at least this is early evidence, but we're hopeful that it'll continue and certainly we'll find out from Heartline whether that in fact's the case, but so far so good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and so I think those are all of our questions and um, we're out of time. If there are any final remarks from our speakers for, from the audience, um, but I'd like to thank you all again for joining us and thank you to our speakers uh, for a very good uh, discussion. And so before we adjourn, I would just like to highlight a few upcoming ABC events. Um, the first is the ABC Women and Children Table Talk um, series uh, that is happening tomorrow actually from 7 to 8.30 p.m. So be sure to check that out and please register at the website shown here on the slide. And we would also uh, like to encourage any listeners, if you are not an ABC member, uh, to please consider joining ABC. You will be joining a tremendous community of professionals who are committed to improving health equity and the health of all communities. Um, so for those of you who are already members, we challenge you to invite and bring more people into our ABC family. We are doing wonderful things here and we want all of you uh, uh, to be a part of it. And so with that, I'd like to thank all of you again for tuning in and listening. And thank you again uh, to our speakers. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.